Welcome to the UCLA History Department's Why History Matters series. I'm Darnell Hunt, Dean of the Division of Social Sciences at UCLA. UCLA history is consistently ranked one of the top history departments in the nation, and for good reason. Their commitment to advancing historical scholarship and engaging the wider public on the most pressing issues of the day. Our mission in the division is engaging LA, changing the world. The Why History Matters public series does just that by approaching many of the tough issues we face today as a nation and global community with historical context from leading scholars and community leaders. Thank you for joining us for this important discussion on the legacy of voter access in California. My thanks to Alex Padilla, California Secretary of State, and to all of our panelists for participating in this discussion. It is now my pleasure to welcome Chair of UCLA's Department of History, Carla Pastana. Thank you, Dean Hunt. I'm Carla Pastana, Chair of the History Department at UCLA, and I am delighted to welcome alumni, friends, and our community partners to the department's first why History Matters event of the academic year. Thank you all for spending some time with us to learn from our experts during this unprecedented time in our nation's history. The department is proud to be at the forefront of our most important national conversations surrounding voter access, especially as many voters have already begun to vote in this historic presidential election. Why History Matters is a series that brings together scholars and community leaders to discuss important issues in their historical and contemporary contexts. Tonight's discussion on the history of voting access in California features research from our event co-sponsor, the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy. To introduce tonight's event, I am pleased to present a brief video summarizing the findings of the Luskin Center for History and Policy's report on the history of voter access in California, featuring political science PhD candidate Izul de la Vega and an introduction from David Myers, director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy and holder of the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Chair in Jewish History. Following the video, we will launch into our discussion with the panel led by our esteemed moderator, Zev Yaroslawski, who many of you may know from his 40 years as an elected public official and who currently serves as executive director of the LA Initiative at the Luskin Center for History and Policy. Now, let us hear from David Myers and Azul de la Vega. Good evening. I'm David Myers. I teach in the UCLA Department of History and direct the Luskin Center for History and Policy. Our goal at the center is to bring serious historical perspective to bear on key questions of the day. We believe it is essential to learn from the past and to encourage those in a position of power to learn from the past in order to chart a course to a better future. At the Luskin Center, we sponsor a host of public programs and research projects on major issues such as the past and present of homelessness, rent control, white nationalism, and local and state health policy. If you'd like to see these reports or listen to our podcast then and now, go to luskincenter.history.ucla.edu. As part of our work, we've sponsored this summer a research team that explores the history of voter access in the state of California over more than a century. The important work of this team allows us to identify remaining obstacles to unfettered access to voting for all residents of the state. We thank the team for its hard work that has yielded a truly illuminating report. I also want to thank our distinguished panelists for making time tonight, especially our esteemed public officials, California Secretary of State Alex Padilla and LA County Recorder Registrar Dean Logan. And now for a brief summary of the Luskin Center report on voter access in California, I'm pleased to present Izul de la Vega, a PhD candidate in the UCLA Department of Political Science. Thank you and have a good evening. Good evening and welcome to our event tonight. We are very excited to hear from our distinguished panel and we sincerely appreciate everyone who is joining us tonight via Zoom. My name is Aizul de la Vega, and I've been working with Elisa Bellencoff-Katz, 
Sam Haddad, Jean Ramin, and Xavier Slavsky to put together our report, Reckoning with Our Rights, the Evolution of Voter Access in California. I am very appreciative of my amazing colleagues who put in a lot of time, effort, and countless Zoom meetings into completing this research project. And we would also like to thank Secretary of State Alex Padilla and Los Angeles County Registrar Dean Logan for taking the time to meet with us and answer all of our questions. For the past weeks, our team has been researching the development of voting access in the state since the ratification of the California Constitution in 1849. During the first 100 years of the state's history, there was a concerted effort to limit voting access for minority and low-income groups with Chinese immigrants bearing a significant part of that burden. Banned from both public and private employment, Chinese immigrants were further marginalized with literacy tests and poll taxes that limited their access to the vote. By the early 20th century, the state had developed a burdensome voter registration system that largely benefited voters who were white and economically stable. While there were various measures to improve voter access to certain groups, including giving women the right to vote nine years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, as well as the implementation of absentee voting, the barriers that suppressed voting among minorities and the poor stayed largely in place until the post-World War II era. Since then, the state has made great strides to increase voter participation by improving the voter registration system expanding access to absentee voting, and striking down legislation that limited the vote to white residents. The state has passed legislation nearly every single year since 1960 that is directed at improving voter access and has made significant progress in overcoming decades of suppression. The road has not always been easy. While California spent the first 100 years finding ways to limit access to the vote, the rest of the time has been a balancing act between increasing participation and ensuring election integrity. Concerns over voter fraud are a centerpiece of California politics, particularly in relation to absentee voting, which has raised a number of questions since the Civil War period. Numerous lawsuits have challenged the legitimacy of mail ballot elections for more than 100 years, and it is unlikely that those concerns will be going away soon despite the lack of evidence related to absentee voter fraud. Despite these efforts, the California electorate remains wider, wealthier, and older than the state's population, particularly in relation to absentee voting. As the state moves forward in the post-COVID era, where all male elections are more prevalent given health and social distancing guidelines, these disparities will likely need to be resolved to improve participation among new citizens, non-English speakers, and young voters. Although there are limit, lingering issues that may limit participation among some groups, California has made a great effort to reconcile with their past and improve voter access across the state. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to hearing from our panel and discussing the future of voting in California as we grapple with the challenges that COVID has brought to the forefront of our democracy. Good evening and welcome to our discussion. Uh, I want to briefly introduce our panel and get right to the discussion because uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, the first member of our panel is Elisa Belenkoff katz uh, She is the lead author of our report, A Reckoning with Our Rights, The Evolution of Voter Access in California. Elisa is a fellow at the Luskin Center for History and Policy and my colleague and partner here at UCLA. Uh, she had a four decade career in public service before coming to UCLA at both the city and the county of Los Angeles. Most of that time is my chief of staff. Uh, Alex Padilla is the Secretary of State of California, and in that position, he is the Chief Elections Officer of the state. He is a national leader in issues related to elections and voter access. He is a former member of the California State Senate and the Los Angeles City Council, where he also served as its president for a number of years, the youngest president, I believe, in the City Council's modern history. Lori Frazier is an associate professor of political science and African American studies here at UCLA. Among other things, she is the acting director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies. Uh, and uh, uh, her considerable research and teaching examines racial, ethnic, political behavior, uh, African American politics, women and politics, and much, much more. Really honored to have her with us tonight. 
Uh, and finally, Dean Logan is the Los Angeles County Registrar Recorder and County Clerk. It's a heck of a long title, uh, a position he has held since 2006. He is responsible for conducting elections in the largest county in the United States. Election administration has been his professional focus and passion for most of his adult life. I had the privilege of working with Dean when I served on the County Board of Supervisors. So now let's get started with the conversation. I'm gonna just pop a few questions. Uh, start with Elisa, the author of the report. Uh, as, as we all know, and as David Myers uh, alluded to in his introductory remarks, uh, history often informs the world in which we live. Uh, what, what did you learn in this project uh, about the history of voter access in California? And what were some of the important forms of state-sponsored obstacles uh, to the franchise uh, during this period of time? Okay, well, thanks, Zev. Um, and there's a lot to say about this. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, the first Constitution of California, adopted in 1849, limited the franchise to white male citizens. Very shortly after, we had the Civil War, which, as we know, had a radical effect on voting rights across the country through adoption of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution in 1870, which guaranteed that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Well, California was one of only two northern free states that voted down the 15th Amendment in 1870. The legislature continued it, considered it, and voted no, did, refused to ratify it. Nonetheless, obviously it became law, and in California, African Americans were admitted to the franchise. However, the 15th Amendment did not give Native Americans the vote. They were not considered citizens until 1924. And it also did not give Chinese the vote, even though at that time they were almost 9% of California's population. Under federal law, they were not United States citizens. And a later version of the California Constitution adopted in 1879 specifically stated, quote, no native of China shall ever exercise the privileges of an elector in this state. And there's a very interesting discussion in the paper, I hope you all have a chance to read it, about how California justified anti-Chinese measures that we would consider racially discriminatory on the grounds that they were anti-slavery measures. This was during the Reconstruction era. So I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at that. Um, other things that happened during the late 19th century were uh, adoption of an English literacy requirement for voting. Uh, discrimination against immigrants. You couldn't vote unless you had been naturalized for 90 days. Um, also adoption of the Australian or secret ballot in 1891, which was good for battling corruption, but effectively disenfranchised immigrants and poor people who couldn't read English. Also from its founding, California had a poll tax, although we found only ambiguous evidence of any use of the poll tax to suppress the vote. We also had felon disenfranchisement, uh, although we did not find evidence that the number and type of crimes defined as felonies were sharply increased in the late 19th century to prevent black people from voting as happened in many Southern states. California restored the voting rights of ex-felons in 1974. And as I'm sure you're all aware, Proposition 17 on the November 3rd ballot will have passed restore voting rights to ex-felons who are on parole. In addition, there's a whole story about voter registration which California has had since 1866. Um, the United States is one of a very few democratic nations in the world that placed the entire burden of registering to vote on its citizens. In many other countries, if you go to register your car or, or register for the draft or go to social security, you automatically are registered to vote. Not here, here the onus of registering is totally on the citizen. And what that has amounted to is, it's amounted to a barrier on registering and on voting for many people, uh, many low-income people, many minority people, many immigrants. In fact, people have called out voter registration as a form of voter suppression, especially suppression of minority votes. We, in California, we've had voter registration since 1866. Um, it was actually part of a national movement to control who had access to the vote in Northeastern cities that were heavily impacted by immigration of Irish and German Catholics. The states of Pennsylvania and New York enacted voter registration laws but they were only effective in Philadelphia and New York City. So they were just against the cities and against the immigrants who lived in those cities. Um, so just a little bit more detail on the registration. From 1899 until 1930 in California, 
you had to re-register re every election cycle. So every two years you had to trot back to the registrar of voters office and re-register again. Obviously a disincentive to many, many people to register and vote. And from 1930 until 1975, you didn't have, registration was permanent, but if you failed to vote in a November election, your registration was canceled. So again, many, many people thrown off the registration rolls for these reasons. So there's been a lot of improvements since that time. I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about it, but these are some of the things that have been barriers to voting since the founding of the state. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, let me turn to Lori Frazier for uh, the talk a little bit about the moment we're in. This is the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, you've done considerable research uh, on the subject of voting rights in marginalized communities. What are the legacies uh, of historical voter suppression with which we are still saddled today, uh, not just in California, but across the country, to the extent you want to uh, broaden that, that subject? And how does that legacy affect communities of color, especially in the unique pandemic circumstances in which we find ourselves in the run-up to the November election? Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. And that's a great question. Um, this is the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And also we've lost so many giants this year, uh, Representative John Lewis and so many others who are on the front lines to make a reality voting rights and voting access for um, generations of us. There's such a long history and historical context of grassroots organizing, get out the vote, and other forms of voter mobilization among African Americans, the use of the black church, souls to the polls, and other civic organizations who work hard each election cycle to get out the vote. And now, in the face of the pandemic, we worry about so many different things and the impact that the, the pandemic will have. I know that um, African American um, civic organizations and communities are worried about a number of things, including safety at the polls, um, and now um, increasingly the extent to which poll workers um, and others will be protected, um, will be safe in terms of um, turning out. Um, I know that there is the continued legacy of distrust um, of certain institutions and the extent to which their, um, the, the use of mail-in ballots will be safe and secure and if African Americans will have their voices heard via a mail-in ballot process. We all remember that Michelle Obama and so many others said, pack a lunch, bring the yard chair, get ready to stand online, but we wanna make sure that it's safe to do so. We also wanna make sure that the voices are heard for so many African Americans um, if they elect to turn their ballot in via the mail or if they plan to um, early vote. One other thing that I wanted to note in terms of the African American voter turnout, yes, it did decline um, in, uh, by about seven percentage points. The black voter turnout rate um, declined for the first time in 2016, in 20, the first time in 20 years in a presidential election, falling from about 59.6% in 2016. Um, and it had reached a record high, surpassing that for the first time in our nation's history of white voter turnout. It surpassed white voter turnout in 2012. However, um, you know, we need to think about the role of mobilization, coupled with our long tradition of getting out the vote. And, and the role of civic organizations, because mobilization, mobilization, mobilization matters for African Americans and other communities who have historically been disadvantaged at the ballot box. So here we are in the pandemic. We need to think about the, the, the extent to which um, African Americans are Democratic voters. Over 90% are going to vote for the Democratic Party candidate. However, voter choice does not equal voter turnout. So we still need to keep our eyes on the prize with regards to voter turnout and mobilize Black voters in every way that we possibly can to build trust around those who will both work at the ballot box and go to cast their ballot and also trust in the process for mail-in ballots. Vote choice around the Democratic Party does not let folks off the hook and African-American voters still need to be mobilized up until election day. Speak for a second to the issue of, uh, I guess I, I'll put it as a question. Is, is there a reticence on the part of African Americans to vote by mail? Is, is a, there's a tradition of going to the polls. It stems from the civil rights, voter rights movement in the 60s and, and basically presenting themselves at the polls and 
you know, exercising their rights under the franchise. Is there a reticence to depart from that approach and go to a vote by mail approach? I think this is a generational question for African American voters. They, and, I, and I'm excited to hear Dean and, and Alex Padilla jump in here with regards to that question for Californians. And I'm looking at my data from the Collaborative Multiracial Post Election Survey from 2016. And African American mail in ballots was pretty high in the state of California. Still, a lot of work to be done to build trust there. Right. However, the historical legacies for older African American voters, more seasoned African American voters, is the extent to which there's that thick historical legacy of standing online um, and how it, it is tradition and it means something to be a part of the electoral process in that way. And so, again, I am concerned about. Um, are, are more seasoned and, and older African-American voters who may want to turn out in that way, but the safety precautions um, may not be in place where they feel comfortable or their loved ones may not feel comfortable allowing them to do so. And then also coupled with the distrust that they may have in the process of mail-in ballot. Yeah, thanks. Alex, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, you became Secretary of State in 2014. 15. You were elected in 2014. Uh, a lot has happened on your watch to expand, expand access to, uh, to the vote. Uh, talk about uh, your strategy. What's been your strategy since you took office uh, to expand voter participation in California? And uh, what obstacles remain uh, to voter access in your estimation? And what plans do you have going forward to deal with those? Sure. And uh, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight and appreciate the opportunity, Zev. Uh, let me just piggyback on, on the prior question for a second here uh, sure. to say it's exactly why, as much as we're promoting vote by mail to be able to vote safely and securely during the COVID-19 pandemic, November 2020 is not an all vote by mail only election. Right. We are mailing about to every active registered voter, multiple options on how to return the ballot. I won't steal Dean's thunder. Uh, we'll, we'll leave some for him to talk about. But, you know, it was very intentional that we wanted to take that step to, to increase vote by mail, but at the same time work with each county in the state to ensure as many safe in-person opportunities to vote both on and before election day for people who need it, because there's a lot of people who need the in-person option for a variety of reasons, and the people who want it or prefer it, right? It's, it's their right. So in California, it's not an either or. If you vote by mail, you know, it's a lot easier to uh, vote and uh, protect your health uh, from the comfort and safety of your home. But if you vote in person, you know, we're taking all the necessary steps, uh, hand sanitizer, PPE for poll workers, you know, bring your mask, all the uh, you know, physical distancing, all the measures that we need to keep the in-person voting experience a safe one as well during this pandemic. Um, so, so I wanted to make sure to make that abundantly clear. You, know, you mentioned I was elected in 2014, sworn in in 2015. Uh, at the time, uh, California had about 17.7 .7 million voters on the rolls, but an estimated five and a half, six million eligible, but unregistered. So we had a lot of work to do. Uh, Voter turnout in 2014 left a lot to be desired. You know, I remember vividly November 2014, the very election uh, when I became secretary, 42.5% uh, turnout, something along those lines. So low turnout amongst registered voters, let alone those eligible but not even registered. So yes, we'll run through the strategies of how we've increased registration and turnout rates, but let me make something very clear. For me, it's not just about the numbers. We can move the needle on the numbers, but it's also about who it is that tends to be eligible but not registered. If proportionally communities of color, disproportionately young people, disproportionately lower income communities. And so, uh, you know, we wanna make our, uh, our democracy more inclusive. We've gotta disproportionately uplift the voices of people who have historically not participated or been represented in the political process. So how have we done that? Through a variety of policies and initiatives, including, uh, you know, same day registration for people who have historically missed the deadline. Uh, online registration is possible now. So you know, it doesn't get much more easy than that. And I have to, no, don't have to find a form at the post office or the library. The biggest uh, in California, which is now more than 21 million, 
is the impact of automatic voter registration. We talked about how other countries have integrated voter registration through other government transactions. We now have that in California. Anybody who's eligible when they apply for or renew their driver's license or their ID are uh, added to the rolls as a default unless they choose to not be a voter. So uh, the addition of three and a half million voters in California is a big number, but again, disproportionately communities of color, younger people, and lower income communities. Uh, and registrations only have to battle, right? Just because folks are registered doesn't mean they'll turn out to vote. So we've gone through the steps of making it easier to cast your ballot through these additional options. Uh, LA County is one of the 15 counties in California that have adopted the Voters Choice Act. It serves as the model for how we're conducting this November's election during the pandemic. But you know, for going forward, every voter will automatically receive their ballot in the mail. When, when you do that, turnout goes up because we have made it easier for all voters. Uh, you give voters the option of mailing their ballot back in, walking it in, or if they want to vote in person, the flexibility of voting anywhere in the county that's convenient to them, not just a single polling place closest to where they live over the course of multiple days. So we can do this all with the proper security protocols uh, to protect the integrity of the election. Uh, but it's what we should be doing, making it easier, more convenient for eligible people to participate. And when we boost those participation rates, again, we're disproportionately uplifting the voices of uh, communities that have not been represented uh, as well historically. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, a lot of progress that has been made in, in the last few years. Uh, yeah, look, a record, record turnout in 2016, record turnout in 2018, record turnout in our primary, and I predict despite COVID, it's going to be a very strong turnout this November. Dean, uh, the old saying, uh, the whole world is watching, uh, must weigh heavily on you as the elections officer for the biggest county in America. Um, let me ask you, uh, question I asked Alex a few weeks ago, what's keeping you up at night these days uh, in, in the context of this election? And specifically, are we prepared to handle the volume of mail votes? Uh, are we, uh, is the uh, United States Post Office equipped to handle it, as far as you can tell? Uh, is the county system or, or the voter registration list in danger of being hacked by the Russians or somebody else? These are issues that have come up in the news in the last few weeks. And uh, is our voting system ready for prime time this in November? Yeah, th thanks, Zev. It's great to be uh, with everybody tonight and to, to be part of a, a proactive conversation three days out before before this election. I, I think all of the things you point out are, are things that, that weigh heavily on my mind and my colleagues' minds um, who are running elections here in California and throughout the country. It's a complex process. And uh, for a lot of the reasons that we already talked about tonight, the, the um, trying to, to drill down into who are the voters who, um, who face barriers to the process or, or who are, are least impacted when we make sudden changes to the process um, mid, midstream. And, and all of those things are happening at once in 2020. So we've had great progress. Uh, we've, we've worked really hard in Los Angeles County, as you say, the largest elections jurisdiction in the country, but also the most diverse electorate in the, in the country to, uh, to create a voting experience or, or a voting model that, that allows voters to, allows us to meet voters where they're at. And that means um, uh, in addition to the vote by mail ballots, having vote centers that are out in the community in places where people are going to be comfortable going to cast their ballots. And, and now in the pandemic where they're going to feel safe casting those, those ballots. And all of the things that you mentioned, Zev, are, are things that are, are concerned and require a lot of um, dedication and resource. So making sure that the, the technology is working is, is a big job. And, and I do have confidence that, that we have that in place and that we have contingency in um, plans in place for that. But if, if I'm really candid, I think the thing that, that is, is most um, uh, gnawing at me or that kind of wakes me up at night is, is this sense that um, we don't know what, what's going to come next in the next 33 days in terms of the narrative around this election. And, and it's, it's unfortunate. We started to see this in 2018, and, and we talked about this a lot in California, even legislated on it in California about how do you deal with misinformation and how do you deal with, with information that's going on social media um, 
and the influence that that has on on elections. But I don't I don't think any of us anticipated that it would be at the level that it is in in this election. And so uh, so for me, it's. Uh, what that means is as an administrator where you're responsible for the, the technology and the logistics, making sure the doors are open, making sure the election workers are there. Now we, on top of that, have to worry about that, you know, look in, in um, you know, seven to 800 locations that we're going to open in, in LA. Inevitably, there is going to be a door that's not going to open at the time that it's supposed to open. And that's going to, that has the potential to be part of a, a, a much uh, exaggerated narrative than, than what it used to be. It's not just going to be perceived as the door didn't get open on time. It's going to be perceived as this is an intentional way to disrupt the elections process. And it's, a, it's an intentional way to, um, to sway voters who are, are for one candidate or another. Um, and so that, you know, that raises the bar for us. I, I think that means that we have to now recognize that the, the mechanics of running elections are caught up in uh, the political debate and how do we how do we balance that? Uh, make sure that we pay enough attention to that, but not too much attention to that, um, and lose sight of the the mechanics that take take that that are, are taking place. And and that just goes full circle back to the conversation that we've already started here tonight. I I, I thought Lori was um, so articulate about the fact that this really the, the word trust is I think such. Uh, the, the kind of the, the sum total of all of this is that you can have great technology, you can have great access, you can have great policy, but if there's not a level of trust uh, and trust that it's a system for each and every one of those voters and trust that once they go and participate in the process, that it's gonna have some impact, then there's always gonna be more work, work to be done. And, and I think what we're learning, um, just kind of to wrap up on that is that that part of that is expanding our base as election administrators and say so so i'm responsible for getting you the information about the mechanics the when where and how to vote um, but i also need to reach out to trusted messengers uh, people that that within those um, neighborhoods and communities in los angeles county can share that information uh, in a way that it will be trusted and and where where it's conveyed um, with a sense that that it does have purpose, that it does apply to the tradition and to the, the, the element of community that is embedded in the elections process. You know, one of the things that came up in our research, Elisa, maybe you want to address it, uh, the issue of the translations that Izul yeah. pointed out. Why don't you talk about that? Because we got two guys here, uh, the Secretary of State and the, and the County Registrar, who maybe can take something from this meeting that, that can actually improve the translation issue. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, well, this is, this is one, one thing that we found could use some further improvement. Um, we found that there was no, uh, that while the state, state law definitely tells counties uh, where they have to translate into what languages they have to translate, there's no statewide um, protocol for how to go about doing those translations so that some of them are, could be much improved. Um, uh, some of them we, we thought were, that they clearly weren't being written by, by, by native speakers or by uh, re licensed interpreters. Uh, they looked like they were written more on a kind of a Google. One of the things that we found. It, maybe that's something that uh, state legislation can, can address. Uh, I, 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 I hope, I think we lost Alex. Um, yeah, I, I can I can chime in on that though because I think it's I think it's an important point and I think translations um, are, are are one area but I think this applies in other areas of the elections process right that for for a long time elections administration has been based on kind of this pure model of just comply with the letter of the law so the letter of the law says you're going to translate into X number of languages or the letter of the law says you're going to provide accessible voting locations and accessible voting equipment uh, but it, it's only been recently that that we actually started talking to the users of those systems to see if if the spirit of the law was also being met right so i think that goes exactly to what elise is talking about is is a strict translation and we're up to 18 different languages in los angeles county and and sometimes when you're talking about state ballot measures that are dealing with really heavy public policy issues a strict word for word translation is not getting the spirit of what that what what that's all about. I, I remember distinctly um, early in my career um, in Washington where we had a state measure that was about ergonomics and um, we were required to 
translate into uh, Chinese and Spanish? Well, in Chinese, there is no equivalent to ergonomics in the Chinese language. So trying to to do that in a way um, and, and to, uh, and again, I'll go back to, um, to my comment about trusted messengers of bringing in people from the community who say, so how can we present this in a way that ergonomics is going to make sense um, when we translate it into uh, Chinese language. So to your point, Elisa, yeah, you can't just do a Google Translate and check that box and say, yeah, I, I met the requirements of the Voting Rights Act. It has to be a, a partnership with the community. You have to bring in people who understand those translations and can give you that kind of feedback. It reminds me of a story, which uh, I'll tell a very quick story. Uh, uh, one of my missions to the former Soviet Union on democratization, uh, and one of our American embassy people uh, ad admonished our delegation not to speak in idioms because they don't translate the way you think they will in the other language. He said I, he had been giving a, a speech for 45 minutes about partisan politics, and he didn't realize that the interpreter was translating partisan to mean those who had fought the Nazis during World War II. <laughs> so it's you know, one word can set you off course uh, in that sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> true story. Uh, let me let me ask Lori. Um, there's been a lot of attention given uh, this year to the gender gap in general and to suburban women in particular. Uh, uh, we've talked about this. Uh, I was really interested in your uh, observations about this. Uh, is is there an implied racial element? Uh, to this focus on suburban women? I mean, I think the answer to, to some of us is self-evident. Uh, uh, and while we're at it, uh, how, how do race and ethnicity uh, shape the contours of the gender gap uh, in America these days? Yes, uh, so I've done a considerable amount of work on this, uh, particularly since the 2016 election, which left so many folks scratching their head about the role of race and gender and why for example, so many white women cast the ballot for Donald Trump in the face of so many allegations and things that were going on. Um, and so again, many of us have been studying this for decades. Um, and the um, 2016 election really enforced or reinforced the longstanding presence of the gender gap, which is the difference between men and women in supporting the winning candidate. Um, and we, and, and in 2016, there was about a 12% um, a gap between men and women voters. Um, and it showed an overall stronger support among women for the Democratic Party. However, um, my, my work as well as um, so many others in, um, who study uh, race and women in politics shows that women are not a monolith. And um, we need to pay close attention to this in 2016 in California and beyond. The partisan gender gap in the United States between male and female voters, particularly for ele um, national elections, particularly for presidential elections, is driven by the historical patterns of women of color voters, particularly black women, in the majority for the Democratic Party since the 1960s. Partisanship matters. Again, partisanship matters. White women, with the exception of 1964 and 1996, have been consistent supporters of the Republican Party presidential candidates, with the exception of those two years. And this is backed up by several data sets, including the American National Election Study, which is considered by many as the gold standard for electoral data in the US. And so again, we need to pay careful attention um, to the implications of the partisan gender gap, but to make sure that when we tell these stories, particularly for the students that are out there, whether you are a student here at UCLA or you are a student of politics, that you ask questions about the, the role of women and that you treat women not as a monolith, but you look at the differences. For example, I pointed out that um, the partisan gender gap is driven by strong supporters, women of color, black women in majority, for the Democratic Party presidential candidate in terms of white women voting as strong Republicans even during the Obama years. And so this has implications Zip, for your question with regards to party politics. Many of you have read the tweets just like I have coming out of the GOP and Donald Trump um, and some overtures to suburbs. This is nothing new. Suburban mom, soccer mom, security mom. When many of us hear these, we hear a, a cry out to white women, right, for their vote or try to figure out or position the role, particularly of white women in the suburbs. But the thing that we need to know, and this tacks on well with any discussion of the role of the gender gap, 
is that the suburbs are more diverse than they've ever been before. Really, by the year 2000, 60 percent of the metro population resided in the American suburbs, and that's half of all Asian and Latinos. Blacks are um, black suburbanization passed 50 percent in 19 in 2008. And the majority of all immigrants now reside in the suburbs of large metropolitan areas. So Dean, Alex, just look to Orange County, right? With the huge blue wave that happened in 2018. And much of that was driven, again, by the role of racial and ethnic minority groups um, in support of the Democratic Party candidates. So again, unpacking um, these factors and not treating women as a monolith, but trying to better imagine and figure out what their political and policy preferences will get us a long way as we go into the next 30 some days before the election and that we can better unpack the realities of what happens after November 3rd. Yeah, thanks for, for that, um, for those comments. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of food for thought. I. I I want to go back to Dean and Alex for a second uh, and depart a little bit from the history paper, the research paper we've done, and because we have an audience, several hundred people, um, who are probably thinking the same thing that most Americans are thinking. Uh, what's the story about uh, the president's attacks on vote by mail and that it's a, it, the conspiracies and you know to, to defraud the system? Uh, you've been a practitioner in this field, Dean for at least 20, 25 years, I mean, running elections. Uh, what's, what's been your experience? And then Alex, you know, ask for your, your kind of 30,000 foot view on this, but uh, is, there, is there reason to be concerned about a massive voter fraud associated with the vote by mail initiative that the Secretary of State has initiated here in California and, and across the country for that matter? Yeah, I, I don't think there is. I, I think that, that what, what the, what the, the history and data on vote by mail has shown is that that if anything, it it acts as a way to increase access to voting and actually has additional layers of security that that aren't present uh, even in our in person voting experience. So the, the fact that and, and I'm not sure that how common there is an understanding of this that the vote by mail ballots when they come back every one of those ballots is checked uh, the signature on that envelope is checked against the signature of the voter on the voter file and if they don't match that ballot doesn't move forward. Now that that there are concerns, long-term concerns about that, just in terms of things like handwriting. <laughs> but, um, but uh, again, California has been very proactive in in um, first with with many counties that did this voluntarily and now mandated under California law. Um, that even in that process, there's an opportunity to reach out to voters and give them the opportunity to to correct those issues. Um, there's there's now the ability, um, thanks to to the efforts of the secretary and his his team, uh, to to offer every voter in the state the opportunity to track their ballot. So um, you're not just putting that back in the mail, but you're able to actually get text messages. Um, uh, push out messages where you don't even have to go look yourself. It's going to come to you and tell you, yeah, your ballot has been received. It has been approved. It has been counted. Um, the the reality is is there are there are just numerous reports um, and and all of them through the leadership of the the west coast of this country, I would say, that that show that vote by mail is a secure system. We've been doing it for years in California. The only thing that's changing in this election is that every voter is getting the opportunity. Um, to, to do that. Uh, I think it goes back to though the 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 issue that 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 we've all been talking about is 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 how do we how do we combat this misinformation because it's it's out there it, it moves so quickly and there's not enough time and enough resources to re, to respond to that and uh, just to tie it back a little bit to the to the paper and and uh, appreciated Elisa giving me the opportunity to read it I, I think the paper actually shows that there's a history of that too where if you look at that that the the um, the, the history of absentee voting um, in this state um, w w was a partisan issue. And depending on who thought it was to their advantage, um, indicated what kind of position was gonna be, be taken on, on the policy. The reality is what we know about um, vote by mail in, in the real data is that it doesn't favor one party or the other. It favors enfranchisement and favors access. And especially in a time where we're dealing with pandemic, uh, it provides a safeguard that hasn't existed before. Yeah. 
Alex. That's a good trend. Yeah, I think that's a good transition point because uh, whether we're talking about vote by mail specifically, it's not about partisan advantage. Uh, yes, it is convenient. It's also very secure. It's proven to be successful for decades in California and many other states. Uh, but somehow it comes under attack, you know, baseless attacks, frankly, and you know, in insulting and offensive to state and local elections officials who pride themselves in uh, the administration of elections with integrity. Uh, you know, so you ask for sort of a 40,000 uh, foot view of all this, uh, it, it makes our job tougher to constantly correct the record when the misinformation is out there and work harder to make sure that voters have the, the reliable, accurate, official information they need about how to participate. Uh, but whether it's the attacks on vote by mail or a lot of the other, uh, what we can and should label the, the, the voter suppression strategies, right? The policies that some places have enacted uh, they make it harder for some eligible people to register or harder for voters to stay registered or harder for registered voters to actually cast their ballot and have their ballot counted. It's not a coincidence. Uh, you know, some of the litigation challenging these uh, election laws uh, uses the specific language of it seems to be done with surgical precision. And why? It's because they too are very well aware of what Lauren has been talking about whether it's you know, gender gaps or gender demographics and shifting gender demographics geographically uh, or race or age or other sort of uh, voter subgroups. Uh, it's sad when people are exploiting election laws under the guise or pretext of trying to uh, prevent voter fraud when the real effect is not preventing voter fraud, which is exceedingly rare in California and across the country, but the effect of these measures is making it, like I said, harder for some people to participate, disenfranchise, suppress to vote, and try to tilt the scales on the outcome of the election. Our job is to make it, uh, uh, keep the election secure, uh, but make it as easy as possible for every eligible person to participate, but the candidates and the parties have to make their case as to how people will vote. You know, the thing, just, funny thing is- we Yes, of course. I just want to add that in the research, we found that um, the Heritage Foundation, which is a which is a conservative organization, has an election fraud uh, has a voter an election fraud database, and they looked at all the elect all the election fraud in all the states. Their their what they found in California since 1978, the first year that we liberalized absentee voting, there's been exactly one case of. Of, ele of absentee voter related election fraud in the state of California. So that's a heritage foundation. That's yeah, heritage that's what foundation. that's what their study shows. But that's not what you hear them say when they're on the evening news or, or when they're talking about um, how voting is going to happen in this election. <laughs> you know, the fraud uh, from the 30,000 foot, foot view point, point of view uh, is the fraud is that all of these strictures that have been put on voting over the over the decades uh, is designed to skew the electorate, and 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 th that is really it, it, that that's a, a serious fraud because it affects, you know, across the country, millions and millions of people, and you know, it, it, if you have one case in California, or if you had a hundred cases in California, but you enfranchised five hundred thousand people in California, uh, you know, it, 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 you know what the exchange rate is, and, and you're. you're uh, your enfranchisement is, is the winner in that, not, not fraud. Uh, it's always puzzled me. Uh, you know, it, I mean, we make it so difficult voting on Tuesdays. I mean, now it's a little different because you have other options. But when I was first starting to vote, it, it was Tuesdays. And if I had class at UCLA on Tuesdays, uh, I won't tell you what I did, but, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't fraud. Uh, so it, it just makes it harder uh, you know, for, for people. And those things add up when you multiply the number of people who, yep. who for one reason or another, are not able to exercise their right to vote. Uh, that adds up. Um, let me uh, go back to the question of, of uh, what's going to happen uh, in, the, in the next few weeks. Uh, there's a court case today I, I saw on, on the uh, news wires. Uh, I think it was in Pennsylvania where there, there's an issue on um, on, on I won't go into the detail, but it was, there's an issue. How much, you're, you're talking to the attorney general, uh, Alex, all the time, I assume. He's your lawyer uh, for, for uh, these purposes. What do you including, including in about seven minutes. Zip. Okay, I, I promise <laughs> to get you out of here in seven minutes. What, what do you guys anticipate 
uh, not only in California, but in your conversations with other secretaries of state around the country, and I know you're, you're always in touch with them, what, what do they anticipate uh, after November 3rd? How long, you know, you, you could tie this thing up in court for a long time, uh, well beyond January 20th of 2021, and some of the columnists are starting to raise that issue uh, you know, of, of this chaos. What's the plan? What's the expectation and what's the plan if there is a plan? Yeah, and and again, the few minutes that we have left, I'll yeah. just to give sort of a, a summary. The uh, it, it's a little bit of a hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. You know, frankly, uh, I think uh, a lot of the legal action is going to be outside of California. Uh, you know, maybe maybe if there's a, a close house race or two uh, in state, you'll have something at a local level. But if if the lens is really the presidential and what's going to happen there, uh, keep your eye on the battleground states and really only where it's that close. If, if there's a landslide one way or the other, I don't think folks will uh, uh, waste their time and resources trying to challenge something that may not make a difference in the outcome of how a state goes in a presidential contest. But on what basis or on what merits, you know, who knows? Is it uh, going to be you know, the signature verification standards and what it, you know, maybe in, uh, in statute, but what a court may decide otherwise, or it could be, uh, you know, the deadline for vote by mail ballots to be returned. There's a difference across states. In many states, those vote by mail ballots have to be in hand to Dean and his counterparts by election night. Uh, in other states like California, we have a postmark policy. As long as it's postmarked on or before election day, it can arrive a certain number of days after and still be counted as long as it's postmarked appropriately. But even then, it's different. Is it three days? Is it 14 days? Is it 17 days? I wouldn't be surprised if uh, even that continues to get litigated uh, after the fact. So uh, if, if there's a, a critical mass of lawsuits on the same topic, you know, I think then and only then will you see something rise to, to Supreme Court levels. And, and that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but it could be that, you know, three different states, five different states, five different types of lawsuits. Uh, either way, I think it will be all settled in plenty of time for the Electoral College vote in December uh, and for Congress to be seated in January. I don't think it's going to play out for months and months or years, definitely. Well, from your Mouth to God's ears is the old saying. <laughs> I'm going to let you go, Alex, because I know you've got a, meet, uh, a meeting with the uh, AG. So if you, if you need to go, I want to thank you uh, not only for being here tonight, but for spending serious quality time with our research team a few weeks back, uh, as, as did Dean. Uh, so anytime you need to leave, you're, you're excused. Right. Uh, well, stay I, safe, everybody. And Zev, I'll tell uh, the Attorney General you said hi. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Dean, last question, I think, because we're, we're coming close to the uh, witching hour here. Uh, what advice do you have for county voters, for state voters? Uh, what's, what's the best way for them to exercise their right to vote uh, in, in, in terms of mail ballots, where to, where to deposit them if they don't trust the mail, where do you put it, uh, where are the drop boxes going to be? Give us a, a primer on that as we close this out. Yeah, I think the, the best advice I can give voters uh, here in LA, and, and I think this applies to, uh, throughout California, is, is to, to the extent that you can kind of separate the noise from the reality is that, that we, we have a system in California that, that works and that gives you the control as the voter, that you, you have options in how to cast your vote and you should choose the option that feels most comfortable uh, that feels the safest and that feels the most secure to you. So uh, for most voters, we're encouraging them, if you can, vote at home safely with that vote by mail ballot and then return it the way that, that uh, works best for you. If you want that sense of community and you wanna walk it into a voting location um, during the early voting period on election day, please do that. We're gonna create a safe environment for you to do that and you can have that sense of community. If you're gonna return it through the mail, uh, we would encourage you to vote early, get it back in the mail. Uh, again, you've heard that California's laws uh, are, are intended to protect that. So we have a high confidence uh, rate in that. And then for those voters who need to come in and vote in person, whether that's a language issue, an accessibility issue, uh, or if you missed the registration deadline and you um, want to register to vote and vote, um, Take advantage of the early voting period. I mean, to your point, uh, Zev, uh, it's not just Tuesday anymore. We're going to open up vote centers here in LA County on uh, Saturday, October 24th. And then on Friday, October 30th, we're going to open a whole um, slot more. Um, and those will be open every day leading up to election day. So um, don't put this off. If you're ready to cast your vote, take advantage of that early voting period um, and have your votes vote 
voice heard. Um, the, the concern we would have is if you wait until those final hours on Tuesday, that's when we're likely going to see those those congregations of folks, and you're and you're gonna it's going to play a little more on your patience. But um, but we will get you through this, and uh, and we want you to participate. And the machines are going to work this time, all of them, hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Yeah, machines weren't the problem. It was that was operational issues and and growing pains. But we've got them covered, and uh, and we'll make sure those votes count. All right, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Secretary of State Alex Padilla, uh, Lori Frazier from the Department of Political Science here at UCLA, and the Acting Director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies, Dean Logan, uh, my former professional colleague at the county, the county registrar, and Elisa Katz, also my professional colleague and good friend. Thank you for really what I think was a very enlightening conversation. Uh, and before we close, I want to say a few thank yous. I want to thank you on behalf of the Luskin Center for History and Policy uh, and its director, Professor David Myers, my good friend, and our ABLE staff director, uh, Maya Ferdman, who has worked long hours, especially in the last 24 hours. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for their participation and contribution to this timely and important discussion. Uh, I also want to thank the UCLA History Department and its great development team at the Division of Social Sciences uh, by Peter Evans. And I want to thank Dean Darnell Hunt for being with us tonight as well. And for those who are interested, you can find the research report that's been the subject of this whole enterprise. Uh, either, uh, well, the way to get it is on the Luskin, uh, on the uh, Center for History and Policy uh, or Department of History uh, website, luskin.history.ucla.edu. And I'll repeat it, luskin.history.ucla.edu. It's a good paper. Uh, it's worth reading and it's easily, it, it, it's, it's, it's accessible to uh, the average reader. And please check out our podcast titled Then and Now, hosted by Professor David Myers, uh, which you can access on its own tab on the website, which again is luskin.history.ucla.edu. Thank you all very much for being with us tonight and uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Have a good evening. Go Bruins, go Lakers, go Dodgers. <laughs>